I think some of you know who I am. I'm Dr. Chris Nowak. I'm a professor at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And as a professor over the last 13 years, I conduct research and teach uh, subjects related to forest ecology, silviculture, vegetation management, and uh, even forest certification. Now, for five years before I came to the college, I was a research forester with the USDA Forest Service at the Urban Research Work Unit in, in just outside of Warren, Pennsylvania. Over that long time period then, the 13 plus five years, I've conducted and I've worked with the Forest Stewardship Council, the SFI organization, to conduct forest certifications across the Northeastern United States. And, and I do so as a consultant with Smartwood and with the Rainforest Alliance on a, on a periodic but not too often basis per year. I expect uh, many of you actually know me in one of those roles over these past 15 years. I, I would also guess that many of you did not know that I am a Clint Eastwood fan. Also a fan of Ennio Morricone who wrote many of the theme songs, uh, the, the scores for these different spaghetti westerns that Clint Eastwood was in, including this Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, which is one of my favorite movies. In fact, I can't help but whistle. I mean, just an iconic uh, movie score. Now, these, these Clint Eastwood passion I have, Ennio Morricone, um, of course, many of you know I like to drink coffee, and so you'll see me periodically drinking coffee throughout the presentation, particularly as I get a bit dry. My work as a professor, my passion in silviculture, I can weave all of these things together in my presentation today, this, this good, bad, and ugly, these personal reflections on silviculture from a decade of FSC forest certifications. Now these reflections that I have are really based on and centered on an interest I have, a passion I have for assessing silviculture. Uh, silviculture is a discipline where performance, your, your effects on the forest, on the ground, are there for decades to people to, for people to see. And with that sort of mark that we leave on the land, it's fairly readily accessible for us to assess ourselves as we operate as silviculturists, students for me as I teach them how to do silviculture. And in my work over the last 15, 20, 30 years, I've had ample opportunity to assess silviculture on college properties through the USDA Forest Service. And of course, as I mentioned, through FSC certification. It's what I do. I teach silviculture. I actually assess silviculture in that process. But it's actually what all silviculturists do in order to improve our work. Assessment of silviculture, like assessment of anything, is based on a com common understanding of what it is that we're assessing, of what silviculture is in our case. We have, in the Society of American Foresters, defined silviculture, progressively different over time, expanded over time, honestly. And currently we define silviculture as the art and science of controlling the establishment, growth, composition, health, and quality of forests and woodlands to meet the diverse needs and values of landowners and society on a sustainable basis. Fairly succinct. And with that succinctness comes a, a critical component that almost every word is critically necessary for the definition. Art and science. Art, of course, comes from personal perspectives based on experience and abilities to integrate socioeconomic and environmental decision-making factors. The science comes from the long-standing bodies of biology, ecology, human dimensions research that undergirds and needs to be integrated into our silvicultural decisions. Of course, we focus on care and tending of trees, but not just trees as individuals, trees as communities as they exist in these features called stands. We conduct silviculture only at the behest of the landowner. It's only because the landowner wants something different from the forest than is currently there, different from that particular stand that we're working in, that we even manage the system at all. But a modifier to that, and this is something relatively new, is we just don't manage for the current landowner in terms of how we fashion stands and the conditions with which they set and are created to be and will develop into. We think about the future, what the next landowners will be, and, and we try to provide to them all kinds of different options and opportunities to have the same values, benefits, and services that the current landowner has, if not more. And of course, all of this to make the stand better in general. With that kind of idea, silviculture can be considered sustainable both in a very narrow but also a very broad sense. 
Now importantly, especially for forest certification, silviculture is accessible based on tangibly observable and or measurable efforts and outcomes. Um, one of those measurable efforts is this idea of investments to improve stand condition. Inputs, capital oftentimes associated with something that's measurable by dollars, but also silviculture is accessible based on the degree and level of skills and knowledge that have been applied to improve stand conditions. At ESF, I have worked with colleagues, Ralph Nyland, Drs. Ralph Nyland, Rene Germain, and Russ Briggs over the last 10 years to really wrestle this idea of assessment and combine these two elements of inputs, capital and then skills and knowledge, into what we call the silviculture surface. Graphically, this surface can be simply portrayed and you should know that we can actually make this eventually into a three-dimensional diagram which will be part of another presentation or at least another paper that we need to get into the literature. But the rudiments of the silvicultural surface would look like this with skills and knowledge along the y-axis ranging from low to high in terms of degree of inputs and then along the x-axis again low to high in terms of inputs is capital and other resources. Of course, capital and other resources is something that's directly measurable, and I put the dollar signs in there to indicate that. But these are things such as people's time, uh, machinery used, chemicals applied, things that actually have tangible dollar-based value that you can measure. In, in contrast to that is something that's not quite as easily measurable, but certainly discernible, this idea of application of skills and knowledge. And those skills and knowledge sets include such things as the application of stocking charts to control stand density in some refined way and then actually using those stocking charts to understand how how intensely or not to cut a stand to favor residual trees or to favor regeneration. That's the skills and knowledge, an example of skills and knowledge that we might apply in the context of this silviculture surface. An outcome then of this application and inputs of these skills, knowledge, and capital and other resources is silviculture. Silvicultural practice requires high-level inputs of skills, knowledge, and capital. Capital, as I indicated, is associated with these tangible, measurable inputs. Skills and knowledge uh, very specifically based upon both experience and science-based underpinnings biology, ecology, social science associated with human dimensions. It's with this combination, when these two aspects are combined, that we find across this surface a broad area that we would consider to be silvicultural and outcome. Of course, this breadth of this area here indicates or supports this notion that silviculture is both an art and a science. There is no one way to do silviculture in any one particular situation. Instead, there are various opportunities to conduct silviculture, and, and those opportunities are produced by that artistry of how that particular forester weaves together all the socioeconomic and environmental considerations to produce some sort of output or outcome to create some sort of condition within the stand. So silviculture is not just one thing. It's an artistic possibility of many things in any one particular stand at any one particular time. We recognize that silviculturists, foresters, those that conduct this discipline in any one particular stand is somewhat constrained, if not strongly constrained, by a variety of different factors. Any one forester may be constrained by the landowner, the site and its capacity, the vegetation and the soils that are there to actually produce the conditions and outcomes and outputs that we have interest in. Environmental laws and regulations can constrain a forester to be fixed in one place of the surface versus another. And of course, the personal capacity, the skills and knowledge of that particular forester um, also constrain location within the surface. But we know that you can be on the surface regardless of the socioeconomic and environmental cons constraints with which you are presented. Every situation affords for us the opportunity to be on the silviculture in some way or another. You can also guess that there, are, there is a place on the surface, particularly in this end of low inputs of skills, knowledge, and capital, 
where the outcomes are not associated with silviculture, but instead are associated more with just cutting trees, that is timber harvesting without silviculture. Non-silvicultural exploitative approaches to harvesting trees can cause ecological degradation, where the stand is made worse in terms of condition and output of values into the future. And of course, we would consider this not sustainable. This background on defining silviculture and introducing our silviculture surface really sets the foundation for what can be considered to be good, bad, and ugly in practice, where the good is associated with a sustainable outcome and silviculture, and the bad unsustainable and not silviculture. Of course, this sets us up to understand how I use these definitions to apart assess silvicultural practice, particularly and more recently through this forest certification work that I've done. All right, and with that, I think we've already begun to meet the purposes of the presentation. That is to define silviculture with some emphasis on introducing to you this, this concept, this metaphor of the silvicultural surface. Of course, the, the, the overall purpose of the presentation is to expand, to elevate our silvicultural endeavors. And I want to do this in two different ways. One is to, affirm, through affirmation and expansion, build your knowledge and skill sets from where they're at to where they could be, and perhaps do that in the short term with the presentation, but hopefully with the presentation, st stimulate thought and conversation so that our growth can continue beyond this one presentation. Now, my presentation is based upon 33 years of, of, ha of having opportunities to think about and work with silviculture. The source of the presentation, though, more specifically, is this consulting work I've done for Smartwood and, and SCS with FSC and some with SFI since 1997. And that kind of work includes peer reviews of reports, verification audits, annual audits where we go out and visit with organizations that have already had their uh, assessments and have their certificates. Uh, but what I really like to focus on is these assessments, these initial interactions with forest management organizations to compare their practices and performances against the certification standards. It's with that assessment that we really get a glimpse on and at the actual practice of silviculture as is occurring across the northern forest. And my work actually pertains specifically to the northern forest as the certification work I've been involved with extends from Wisconsin to Maine to Pennsylvania, although I think the results and the reflections may have applicability elsewhere. Because these are assessments and there's a high degree of confidentiality in terms of the results as we've learned about these organizations and their practice, I have to keep my, my reflections general. Um, I also have to protect the anonymity of individuals and I'm going to use slides and photos of the forest and silvicultural practice as I have gathered from certification efforts. So you see this person here with a blue dot over their face, that's just to protect his anonymity. Over the past 14 years, as I have worked with organizations and silvicultural and forestry certification, currently the jobs I have worked on include 14 organizations that still have certificates that I've had some role in assessing. This initial interaction with this organization to judge whether or not they're conducting sustainable forest management. These 14 different organizations range across the spectrum of forestry practice, including private consulting, private industry with small sawmills, uh, governmental organizations that uh, run um, tax abatement programs, which are actually uh, run through forestry consultants. I've also worked with large forest management organizations, both for private industry and for government. You see, all total, there is f over 4 million acres of forest land that I've had the opportunity to think about and engage through certification. I think conservatively I've, I've assessed silviculture in hundreds of stands, interacted with at least 75 foresters and all the documents that come with their work. Um, so while my reflections can only be general and qualitative, I think they may be substantial and real given the broad and meaningful sources with which I've been exposed to and have the opportunity to learn about and think about silviculture. Now as you can imagine, particularly if you know me, I could talk for hours and hours about silviculture and certification, but I have constrained myself 
and I will present to you only one set of good observations and reflections and one set of ugly. Knowing that there's lots of other things we could talk about about these, but I searched hard and think I pulled out what are the more, more important good and ugly associated with these reflections from over the past 14 years of thinking about and working with silvicultural performances. I would also note that the focus of the photos and the focus of the results are with private consultants. Now the reason I say that is because I don't want people to actually listen to the presentation and think about or worry about the notion that the results were swayed strongly by governmental effects where the government has lots of resources and can do things in terms of inputs and investments at a level far greater than the private consultant or the industry. Yet I would offer to you that I can present to you this story just with the private or all the combination of all three and still come up with the same story. I would also offer as an aside that this story is not about forest certification, but is meant to be more generally a statement and a state can a state accounting of silvicultural practice. Organizations that first engage FSC to be certified bring their history of silviculture to bear for us to scrutinize and to compare against the standard. So it means that we're looking at silviculture as had been practiced by that person and by that organization before certification occurred. So by reflecting on these assessments, I think we're looking at silviculture before, sil before certification has been fully implemented, which means I think it has bearing on forestry practice in general in the eastern hardwood forest at the least. As expected, there is actually much good in silvicultural practice across the northern hardwood region, across this northern forest from Wisconsin to Maine to Pennsylvania. It may extend beyond that. My expectation is that it does, and that's why the reference to the eastern hardwood forest region. I've seen and, and, can, and can consistently remark about investments and inputs into the system more related to the capital in this particular case, although undergirding these kinds of investments in the system are uh, skills and knowledge. Uh, marking of trees for cutting, investments in cutting of non-commercial trees, uh, use of herbicides to control interfering plants, fencing to exclude deer, planting and pruning. Uh, but the real good is that silviculture is just being practiced. And not just being practiced, but there are many examples of classic silvicultural systems being applied that include um, well-conducted tending and regeneration methods. This is not surprising, of course, because in certification, silviculture has to be practiced, and it must be that most certified organizations came into certification because they are already conducting themselves according to sustainable forest management uh, ideals. And, and since silviculture is at the core of sustainable forest management and an important part of certification, um, it's not surprising that silviculture is being practiced. But remember, these are based upon assessments. This is what the organization was doing before we got there. Remember, silviculture is something where performance cannot be brushed away. Once you do something to a stand, the mark of that doing is there for centuries, certainly decades. It's hard to escape performance of silviculture it's hard to escape performances associated with timber harvesting. So with certification, I've actually been able to observe all kinds of silvicultural practices, um, starting with mechanical thinning in, in this Norway spruce stand. This is a fairly common practice in these conifer plantations, particularly initial thinning efforts. I've observed free thinning fairly commonly, in this case in a northern hardwood stand. Uh, note the down trees, these felled trees that for this particular operator were not considered to be merchantable. And so these provide an interesting sort of pulse of coarse woody debris into the system. But also notice that the biggest and best trees, at least from a high quality saw timber perspective, were conserved in the stand and were taken care of. Silviculture. 
beautiful crown thinnings in northern hardwoods, and in this case, in a sugar maple dominated stand. Various kinds of even age reproduction efforts. This is a, a classic seed tree cut with birch trees in northern Wisconsin. This is a strip cutting in a black spruce tamarack area. Interestingly, and I, I make note of it there with the NIPF in the parentheses, non-industrial private forest, or what's now known as family forest, this was a family forest. And yet here, as in the previous slide, and as in this next slide, which is a clear cut in a mixed wood stand, it was interesting to observe consistently across this broad region that even aged methods of regeneration were being applied to these NIPF or family forest lands. That's sort of an interesting discovery of this whole process is that this purported aversion to even age practices may be overblown within our industry. It is possible on these family forests to actually conduct these types of operations. Here's a clear cut with re reserves in a mixed wood stand um, on another NIPF piece of land. And uh, a shelter wood, even age reproduction. So yes, classic silviculture, as has been modified a bit over time. You saw the one clear cut with reserves, which is something I think that's becoming more common than it had been in the past. So classic silviculture with both tending and regeneration is common across the region. But also common, there's another type of thing going on in the forest, particularly in association with private consulting forestry, where silviculture is being conducted on the edge. It doesn't really fit within the classic sy systems. And of course, I call this silviculture on the edge, edgy silviculture. Edgy silviculture is common and is associated with even age stands where both tending and regeneration are, are practiced together in a stand each time the stand is entered. There are no published guides or texts on how to do this edgy silviculture, so it is practiced in a sort of uh, seat of the pants kind of way. Yet with that, it still seems to me that this is a sustainable practice. And, and, and with that is, is silviculture. Now operational parameters drive um, edgy silviculture. These foresters do not work in these stands unless they can produce an operable cut. And, and they're sort of low-end operable cuts, 1,000 board feet plus or minus 500 board feet per acre depending on the scale and the value of the trees that are being cut, and about 5 to 10 cords a pulp wood or wood fiber being harvested, or not, depending on the operator, but at least they're marked for harvest. Um, regeneration is produced by harvesting large trees in groups and patches, often with advanced regeneration. And tending occurs throughout the stand in conjunction with those regeneration efforts through various combinations of improvement cutting or free thinning so that the overall stocking within the stand is taken below the sea line. And of course, if it's below the sea line, that means that regeneration is likely stimulated either in terms of germination or development of advanced regeneration somewhat uniformly across the stand. Now photographically, this is how these, this operation might look. And these were taken from actual edgy silviculture operations. Of course, big trees are harvested. That's what produced that operable volume of saw timber. They're oftentimes the lower quality trees so that overall the system in terms of that size class is upgraded in quality. And of course those trees are then left behind to provide seed to produce a cohort of offspring that have the same at least opportunities for the gene pool that their parents had, these positive parents had. So harvest big trees oftentimes associated with patches and pockets of advanced regeneration. In those patches and pockets and throughout the whole stand, um, advanced regeneration is protected and released. And then the rest of the stand is tended. And you see in this slide here, these trees here are marked a bit above DBH with blue. They're marked to be cut. You notice that they're the smaller, lesser trees in terms of at least saw timber production. And so the stand is upgraded through this combination of improvement, cutting, and free thinning with the idea that the stand through it trying to pursue this operable cut will 
promote regeneration across the stand because the intensity of the cut will dip the stand below the sea level in terms of stocking. Oftentimes the trees that are removed from the stand in these types of operations, particularly in these tending operations, are focused on removing undesirable species. Sometimes they're removed from products, sometimes not. In this case here, this black birch, you see the marking, this is that investment of effort to try to improve the stand through the forester's impact on the cutting through the marking of trees to be cut. Now with these tandem of cuts, this combination of regeneration coupled with tending in these even age stands, we produce outcomes, we produce conditions in the stand that over time start to create not even age conditions but multi-age conditions such as the case here in this oak hickory stand that has been managed with edgy silviculture for 20 plus years. Here too in northern hardwoods on the left and transition hardwoods with a northern red oak component on the right. These stands, and in both cases here with two different foresters, these stands were created over the course of a 20 year period, two or three entries into the stand. We're starting to see this multi-age condition unfold to the point where eventually, if not soon, these stands could be managed with uneven age silviculture. In summary, in terms of edgy silviculture, it is commonly practiced. Um, currently, it's more art than science, hence the seat of the pants reference. It's likely useful that it could be referred to more as conversion cuts, taking even age stands and converting them to uneven aged. In some cases, perhaps restoration cuts where you're taking degraded stands and upgrading them in terms of their character, their condition. Without exception, for all the foresters I've talked about, and there's, there's quite a few of them that actually practice this, this, this edgy silviculture, the first thing they talk about is the importance of regeneration. And they present that importance in the context of this being an anti-catastrophe practice. And by that I mean, and what they mean, is that in the, in the course of practicing forestry for 20, 30 years, these folks have learned that all kinds of things happen to stands that are unplanned, oftentimes catastrophic in nature. It could be a thunderstorm downburst, a tornado, an insect outbreak that actually kills the trees that you've been trying to take care of. In this case of this picture here, you see the white ash in the foreground has a mark on it to be cut. So right here, this forester has marked this ash to be cut in advance of emerald ash borer's entry into the stand. And we know that as a catastrophic, non-native, invasive insect that is set to actually uh, change white ash presence and stands all across the eastern United States to the point where it will nearly extirpate it. Now the, the various kinds of researchers and scientists are trying to determine the actual potential extent of that non-native invasive organism, trying to pursue biological and chemical controls for it. What's important here as part of edgy silviculture is this forester didn't realize that it would be emerald ash borers, the catastrophe, but over the course of the previous 20 years, he had fashioned a bank of regeneration of desirable character, sugar maple and white ash, from these desirable parents in terms of their character so that the stand is now conditioned to absorb the catastrophe. And yes, there is white ash. You see the sunlight here is certainly enough in this stand to support a white ash understory, so that if the biological controls for emerald ash borer do develop, it's, we have not lost ash from this stand. The stand has been conditioned to actually withstand that catastrophe. Now, edgy silviculture, in reference to our silvicultural surface, is considered to be edgy because it actually sets right on that edge between not silviculture and silviculture, and with practice, I expect um, it'll be able to move up the surface. Of course, now to the ugly. Now, now recall that these ugly outcomes of, of these assessments are based on forestry organizations when they were first assessed. Over time, many if not all of these ugly elements have been remedied through improved practice. That's part of certification improvement over time. Some of these ugly elements include uh, silviculture being practiced in stands without uh, a basis of inventories, 
Uh, related to that is uh, silviculture being practiced um, without the use of stocking charts, um, silviculture being practiced with, with incomplete written prescriptions, uh, silviculture being practiced at the stand level with inconsistent protection of those stand level recently, last few decades, critically important recognized stand habitat features such as stick nest, vernal pools, and monolithic rocks. And, and just like before, where I could just talk and talk about each of these features, and they all deserve their own presentation, I think the, the really ugly <whistles> is the purported application of uneven age silviculture. For, for example, Here's a slide of what was described to me as being a group opening. And honestly, for a group opening, it looks pretty good. Trees of varying sizes have been cut and removed from the site down to about one inch DBH. The area associated with what had to be considered not just mature trees, but immature trees, have been removed to dedicate completely the ecological space of this, this opening to a new age class. But what made this not uneven age silviculture is that the rest of the system, the rest of the stand, was not tended. Even age silviculture requires both tending and regeneration to occur within the stand each time the stand is entered. This stand here, which is an even age stand of sugar maple and yellow birch, was described to me as having been managed under uneven age silviculture. When I press the forester to ask what kind of residual structure and density conditions he was using to guide the cut, for example, what Q factor did he use, he was unable to tell me because he did not know even what a Q factor was. The other problem here, if you notice, is that there is a bank, the brown leaved understory is American Beach. And American Beach, as part of an uneven age system with beach bark disease and other problems of beach um, in terms of its ecological role and, and functionality in terms of forest products values, that's probably something we don't want the system to shift into, yet this forester had not really thought about the fact that the kind of practices that were going on were actually favoring the development of a beach understory. This is not uneven age silviculture. Almost all the organizations I've worked with over the last 14 years with certification have described using uneven age silviculture in riparian areas. And while riparian areas by and in themselves are hardly big enough to consider as a separate community, they are. They are a separate community. They are a separate stand. They're reserving individual and separate attention. The problem that I see with uneven age silviculture in riparian areas is that it's not being practiced. All that's being done is select individual trees, usually the large trees, are being plucked from the system without much care to residual structure and density within the stand without much care even to riparian areas as functional features on the landscape, either as wildlife habitat or even just to protect water quality. So summarily, in, in regards to uneven age silviculture, nearly all foresters claim to do it. Now the area actually possibly involved in terms of those claims in total, generally across the northern forest, is about 10% of the area, particularly associated with riparian areas. Only a few organizations and a few individuals are really doing uneven age silviculture. This 10% of the area being affected by the system are areas that, at least when these organizations were assessed, were not being conducted, were not being treated with silviculture. They were not being treated with uneven age silviculture. To me, uneven age silviculture is only applicable to uneven age stands. With uneven age silviculture comes a planned application of both tending and regeneration so that every time the stand is entered there's some planned effort at both regenerating the mature trees and their remove, through their removal and then tending the immature trees. Of course, another part of an uneven age silviculture is actually have defined objectives for stand structure, stocking, and species composition and, and elements of when we might consider individual trees to be mature. The intensity of harvest, which trees we cut, are set by those defined objectives. Those defined objectives are captured by this uh, mnemonicon BDQ. 
we can decipher BDQ, and, and hopefully for some of you this is just a reminder, if not an affirmation of what you know. This is a classic diagram of uneven age stand, both in terms of its current condition, which is this upper curve here, in reference to what might be considered a desirable future condition or a reference curve. And what we're looking at here is a fairly conventional diameter distribution diagram where the number of trees is graphed as a function of the size of those trees by average dBH. And, and what's important about an uneven age stand is that these small trees are young and these big trees are old. The BDQ comes from what this curve, reference curve, is telling us in terms of the desired condition for the future of the stand. B for the BDQ is residual basal area. And in lots of ways, it's the area collectively under this curve that is the total representation of the abundance of trees across these different size classes. D is the diameter of mature trees, above which we harvest those trees when we enter the stand. That's what the X here represents. And it's this portion of the stand here then, this and above, that is the area of the stand that's dedicated for purposeful regeneration knowing that regeneration is occurring across the stand, but is focused on occurring in these areas where the ecological space is dedicated to the new age class, the removal of these mature trees. The difference between the current stand curve and the reference curve for the trees below X, as hatched here indicating what we would harvest, is the tending activities that would occur in these Im immature age classes to refashion the stand to this reference curve. These reference curves can vary depending on species composition of the stand, and the Q represents, in some general way, the slope of that curve. So BDQ is a refined approach to actually conducting uneven age silviculture that allows us to specifically control structure, density, and species composition. Another element of uneven age silviculture that's been given short shrift is just the monitoring of the stand not just before, but after the operation through time, paying attention particularly to the regeneration. And if we have problems with regeneration, we start to regenerate species that we are not, um, that we don't, that, we, that are not desirable for us. It may require that we actually remove them through site preparation to make uh, room in that stand for new age classes of trees of desirable species. But these components of uneven age silviculture can be set in progression and set in a progression of investments into the stand, that is inputs of skills, knowledge, and capital. So here's our idea of investments and inputs into the system. And if all we're doing is cutting the big trees, that's not silviculture. It's relatively low end in terms of investment in the system if any investment at all is made. We can progress up if we actually harvest the big trees, so take care of number one there, but also look to improve the stand through tending the immature age classes. We will move up in terms of our investments into the system and start to consider that that particular set of investments is consistent with some form of uneven age silviculture. If we add one and two together and produce number three, so it's one and two as guided by stand level inventory and the BDQ objectives. We're getting more refined in terms of the input, our efforts to control the system through inputs of both skills, knowledge, and capital. Finally, if we couple that with a refined monitoring of the system and site preparation to control the abundance and composition of regeneration, we have indeed moved further up in terms of application, refined application of uneven age silviculture. We can portray those four steps, those four levels of application of uneven age silviculture on the silviculture surface. With one placed in the lower left-hand corner, where there is low input of skills, knowledge, and capital, and of course cast in that arena of not being silviculture, not being sustainable. And then two, three, and four perhaps being progressively higher level efforts in conducting silviculture. And of course, we can cast these four different levels of application of uneven age silviculture using the thematic words of the presentation. We see that the application of uneven age silviculture can range from bad, where it's, it's only harvesting of big trees, up through to, to great. Remembering that observed efforts to apply uneven age silviculture at best 
have ranged in this ugly arena, at, at times have slipped down to bad, and have only rarely, and there are some organizations that do this, have only rarely been conducted at this good, if not great, level. Now, I've finished presenting my one good, that is, silviculture is being practiced, and I've also finished presenting my one ugly, that unalienated silviculture is often done in name only. What summary meaning can be had from this effort to tell you about the good and the ugly? Well, let me start by reflecting on this idea that based on personal observations during these initial assessments of certified forests, um, we discovered that silvicultural practice is occurring. Of course, it's expected, but it is occurring. We also expect that with certification, any shortfalls in silviculture are, are set to be fixed over time as organizations are held accountable through corrective actions or observations in order to maintain their certificate. But key here is that the first impression when you do an assessment is reflective of the best practices as normally can occur outside of certification. That is, what we are looking at when we first assess an organization is silviculture as it is being applied across the northern, if not the eastern, hardwood forest. With that observation and that reflection, to me, it says that silviculture can be broadly applied, can be broadly practiced across a range of land ownerships, from family forests to large industrial through to governmental. This indicates to me that it is possible to conduct silviculture as a part of normal forest management business and stay in business. Edgy silviculture. We should recognize it. We should recognize it formally as a way to convert and restore stance. Practitioners should consider these as conversion and restoration cuts, perhaps as irregular shelter woods, perhaps as something else rather than a no-name, seat-of-the-pants practice. By doing so, it, it, it provides to foresters the opportunity to look into the literature, to look into the textbooks and learn about how to do this practice because under some of these more conventional ideas, a conversion restoration, which are somewhat recent, or, or older ideas like irregular shelter was that we might be able to improve that practice to be more consistent, regulator, regu regular, and uh, perhaps with that some provide for us some sort of more opportune ways to actually predict what the outcomes of our practices are going to be in some meaningful way. That aside, there are things going on here where I don't think the science underpinning is strong enough to actually help practitioners, and so I think we do have to do some focused research and development in order to improve the consistency and regularity of these practices. This is the most common silviculture being applied across the eastern hardwood forest, this edgy silviculture. Opportunities for improvement aside from edgy silviculture really are key to two things that are related to each other. One is this, these, this idea that riparian areas and the application of uneven age silviculture within them, um, I mean we have claims of uneven age silviculture, these claims can be better met in practice. If you're saying that you're doing uneven age silviculture, um, then you should know about it and you should really do it. Foresters should really know their BDQs. Um, in riparian areas, as uneven age silviculture is applied, it should be applied. At the same time, I think there's lots of shortfalls in information on how to manage riparian areas appropriately. It may not be that uneven age silviculture is not appropriate. It may be that that system leads to more problems than benefits. We just need to learn how to manage riparian areas in a way that's consistent um, with sustainable forest management that's consistent with silviculture. I think finally, in terms of what it means to me, let me offer to you the observation that this silviculture surface, this surface really does work as a way of conceptualizing and portraying, assessing and evaluating the level of silvicultural performance. Silviculture really is about investments to improve a stand, investments in inputs of skills, knowledge, and capital. I offer to you to use this surface as you see fit to help cast your own work, to help assess the work of others, and to teach people about what silviculture is.
It's, it's only with reflection about where we are at that we can really take steps up and improve. I think the silviculture I have observed over the last 10 years puts us generally in the middle of the surface. We're doing okay. Some are doing good, some are somewhat ugly, but on, on balance, I think silvicultural practices are okay across the eastern hardwood region, across this northern forest that I have experience in. I mentioned this to uh, Roger Jengaleski, who's the current president of the Society of American Foresters, and his reaction to me was, Chris, okay is just not good enough. I agree. I think this, this idea that silvicultural practice as observed as generally good to okay with only a bit of ugly leads to this notion that there's ample possibilities for us to do better, for us to be great. That progression from okay to good to great is a progression in the improvement in skills and knowledge coupled with a capacity and willingness to invest capital into the system. That is, make effort to move up both axes of the silvicultural surface. I'll end by just retitling my presentation based upon what we actually discovered together in the presentation. It's not just the good, bad, and ugly. It's the good, the okay, maybe the edgy, the great, and the ugly. I appreciate this opportunity to think about silviculture in this way, to, be, to have this opportunity to cast my reflections in some formal way and share them with you. I appreciate that opportunity to share with you my reflections about silviculture based on this past 14 years of FSC certifications. I'm glad that you took the time to listen, to think. I would be glad to learn of those thoughts. Any concerns you have, any questions, uh, please share them with me. Thank you.